So good morning, everybody. Um, I have the difficult task of replacing Karl Zimmer for this session. Um, I don't think he is re replaceable, but uh, I will do my best. I'm Serge Michel, the chief editor of uh, Hi.News, a new Swiss media. And um, so uh, welcome to this uh, panel. We'll, uh, I introduce shortly the two speakers. So Nina Facio next to me um, is representing the network uh, Solution Journalism in Europe and uh, the, for several years. And Elizabeth um, McGowan uh, next to her uh, is a long time energy and environment reporter. She has worked for Inside Climate News, Energy Intelligence and Crane Communication. She also got a Pulitzer Prize for a report on um, the Dilbit disaster inside the biggest oil spill you never heard of. So, um, in spite of being Swiss, I won't be neutral uh, in this discussion because I'm quite in favor of uh, solution journalism. Um, and I just shortly introduce you um, some of the things we tried, um, even if in Europe the solution journalism is not as developed as in the, in the US. Um, I tried to, to, to create a desk for solution journalism at Le Monde, where I used to be an editor. Um, and I, I did a few tests. For example, um, in a drought in Ethiopia, um, I've sent a reporter there and I asked her to, um, to write two reports, one about the problem, one about the solutions. Um, so the problem was like cattle dying, um, farmers being deprived of the revenues, um, the fields being completely dried, and um, like misery and poverty and um, so and the, the, the solution one, the solution piece, was about a village who managed to, to build small walls to retain the water when there is water, to separate the cattle from the, from the fields, and uh, plant some trees and pr some practices of agroforestry that, that improved a lot the, 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 the living of the people of the village. And then I published the two reports uh, on Le Monde website at the same time, at the same place, uh, parallel, and um, what I could see is that um, the, the report about solutions well, had uh, uh, three times more readers than the report about the problems. Um, the other thing is that this report about solution wa was much harder to do uh, for the reporter because there were more investigation, more phone calls, more uh, people to see it and experts to, to speak with uh, in order to, to prepare it. And also, I, I had to admit that there was a much more engagement from the audience. Uh, this article was much more commented, shared uh, on the social networks. And it, it was also on, uh, at that time, uh, that was back in, 19, uh, in uh, 2017, uh, it was the report that has uh, the s uh, alone um, provoked the most subscription to the, to the newspaper Le Monde. Um, so Really, I, I'm a fan of solution journalism. Um, so now maybe Nina, uh, would you yes. cross the, sea, the, the stage and, and show us your, your presentation, please? Good morning, everybody. I'm glad you're all here early in the morning. Um, so solutions journalism uh, might be a response to a problem in the media industry that we see is too much negativity that leads, you know, that has an impact on the audience. It leads to apathy, a desire to tune out and participate in the mistrust that is uh, nowadays in the media industry. If you take the example of climate change that we hear a lot today, look, have a look at these headlines. So this is what usually you hear about when talking about climate change, and you barely don't hear anything about the solutions that are related to that problem. If you take the headlights separately, there is nothing wrong about it. We need to know about climate change and how you know, important it, it is. But we also need to hear about the responses to that problem to make the right decisions. Um, 
Solutions journalism is uh, well fitted for this kind of topics where you know the conversation is blocked because you have had so many negative information and you feel like you're telling always the same story. You just add one negative information to another, so the story remains the same. It's also true for it's true for long-term topics like climate change. It's also true for um, more like short-term topic like uh, if you remember the Ebola outbreak in 2014. What we've seen at this time is, you know, you need to first know about the outbreak, that's an evidence. And then uh, you need to know if you are at risk in your region and you need to know, you know, what, what's, what's going on and who is exposed. But then after a few weeks or a few months, you just add information that leads to panic. And at this time, what you could see, this kind of headlines, you know, much worse is to come. Uh, y this is an example from uh, The Economist in October uh, 18th, in 2014. And at this time, if, you know, myself as a journalist, I would stop listening because you just feel helpless about it. At this time, you we would have benefited from hearing about, you know, how people organized themselves to respond to that outbreak. For example, Nigeria was one of the first countries to succeed in controlling the epidemic. And it, it wasn't a perfect answer to that. It wasn't a perfect solution, but it, were, it, would, it could have benefited to other countries around. Also, usually when I ask journalists that I'm training, do you know how Ebola was stopped? Nobody knows there was a vaccine. So we often hear about the problem, and then when the problem is over, you just don't know how, what happened. Solutions journalism is rigorous, evidence-based reporting on responses to social problems. I even want to say that maybe solutions journalism is not the right term for that, because solution, you know, suggests that you have the right solution. I don't think there is such a thing as a perfect solution or a solution that lasts. But there are responses, and they are not perfect, but they are, you know, worth reporting on them. Uh, the Solutions Journalism Network, we have, we're trying to make sure that journalists who want to report on those solutions have the same high standards that they would uh, follow for traditional reporting. So making sure your reporting is balanced and not too positive. So we came up with these four criteria uh, to make sure that either you do an investigative piece or a three minutes, you know, radio piece, you have these four criteria and you are sure that your reporting is balanced. So your story should cover a response to a problem and how it happens. That means the response should be at the heart of your story. Provides evidence, looking at effectiveness, you, if, you know, not looking at just intentions and inspiration, but really what are the results of the response. Produces insights that can help others respond to, so that you can replicate the, re the solution if, you, if the context allows it. And points out any limitations or caveats, and that might be the most important point, because uh, solution journalism is often um, mistaken and, you know, uh, it's not advocacy. You should not advocate for one solution than another because you don't know if it will, le it will last. It's not hero stories. It's a lot more complicated just than just one person trying to solve the, save the world. Uh, it's not theories. Uh, solution journalism is, is looking at things that are already happening, already showing results, not, you know, think tank pieces. Uh, it's not promotion and it's not fluff. It's not good news, positive news, feel-good stories. Why do solutions journalism? Well, except they address the problem of negativity in in the media, solutions journalism can strengthen accountability. Why is that? It's because, well, if you take the traditional role of the journalist is to expose wrongdoing, act as a 
watchdog. Uh, we believe that is uh, not sufficient. If you expose a wrongdoing and then you expect for society to self-correct, then you're not talking about you know all the models that can uh, be shown as uh, possible, well possibilities for a change. So turning into from being a watchdog to being a guide dog just is just adding the reporting on possible response that could also put pressure on the decision makers because by showing that maybe one country addressed one problem uh, with success, you're putting pressure on your own country saying, well, if you know they've done it, what are we doing? What are we waiting for? Uh, so you got, going back to the climate change problem, that's particularly you know relevant because people le uh, hear about it, they know there is this huge thing coming, but they just stop listening because they feel petrified. They don't know what to do about it. So if you know me to, if you want to make the change happen, then you need to be to hear about the solutions. And at the Solution Journalism Network. We are actually working on uh, launching an initiative to support uh, solutions reporting on climate change. It can increase reader engagement. I think Serge uh, also noticed that when he was at Le Monde. We, um, we had some research showing that first young people, but not only young people, but particularly are looking for stories that talk about the problem, but also the solution. And we've seen uh, that solutions content is more shared on social media, and the time on page is higher. Um, we've also seen more recently that solutions content can bring more revenue. It gives the whole story. If you, you know, if you consider a topic um, and always talking about the problem without looking at the responses to that problem, then you have an incomplete picture of that topic. I want to give an example. What do we know about the Democratic Republic of Congo? All we hear about is you know, war, violence, Ebola outbreaks. Um, we don't know if, you know, there are some things working in this country and that we could also learn about. Um, this is a really, really good piece published by The Guardian. It's called The Big Sleep, How the World's Most Troubled Country is Beating a Deadly Disease. It's the story of Congolese doctors that have found a treatment for the sleeping sickness, who is a killer sickness. And uh, I think at the beginning of the millennium, more than 30,000 people were contaminated in DRC, and last year it was below 500. So how did that happen? This story is really good because, well, the visual is great, and it's a long story going into the how-to details, how it happened, what are the limits, and so on. Sarah Bosley, is, she's the health reporter at The Guardian who did the story, says the West has got a skewed idea about this country and its people because we only report on the, sadly mainly, negative stories. So together with the Constructive Journalism Institute, we gave the Future of Journalism Global Award to um, Sarah Bosley for that story last January. <coughs> in Geneva, everything happened is in Switzerland. Really briefly, what is it that we are doing? So the Solutions Journalism Network is a non-profit based in New York, and we are uh, trying to spread the practice of Solutions Journalism as a you know, rigorous tool that you can use when reporting to responses to problem. We do community building, that means we're trying to have the teach and learn relationship. So we, if I have one reporter in France looking for solutions to um, one specific environmental problem, and I know Elizabeth overseas had treated the same topic, then I make this two connect and they can share, you know, experience. 
benefit from each other. We also have um, a learning platform. So on, on our website, you can follow courses. We have toolkits on how to do solutions journalism. We have toolkits on how to do solutions journalism on health issues, uh, for example. Also, how to do solutions journalism and investigative reporting. Uh, we have a solution story tracker, which is a database of more 6,000 solution stories that you can show as you know, good solution story that match our four criteria. Um, and we do trainings in newsrooms and to journalists, freelance journalists. We've trained more than 200 newsrooms to the practice of solutions journalism. Uh, to finish, I'll give three really quick tips, and I'm happy to give you more uh, if you want after the panel or during the discussion. How do I do solution stories? I'm, well, first of all, you can't do a story, a solution story on climate change. It is just too broad. So you need to identify an issue or question of concern as precisely of, as possible. What are we talking about? Are we trying to tackle uh, air pollution? Are we, try are we talking about access to water? So you need to really specify what you want to address. Then ask yourself what's missing from the public conversation. Is the problem, you know, is the awareness of the problem sufficient? Do people know about that problem? And if yes, then is the outrage toward that problem sufficient? Because if not, then tradi traditional journalism exposing the problem is probably better. I think all topics can be covered on a solution angle, but not all the time. It's not always the good time to do so. Um, and then start hunting for candidates for a solution story by asking yourself the really simple question, hi, baby. Um, <laughs> who is doing better? Who? Um, confronting with the same problem than my community is doing better than my community. It can be at a city level, at a country level, or you do a smaller level. Who is doing better facing that same problem? I think that's it. Thank you. So, Elizabeth, <coughs> you made a journey uh, from classical journalism to solution journalism. Would you tell us uh, the steps of that journey? Sure. First, I'll make the journey over here. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, and, and thank you for inviting me here. And um, so I guess what I told Nina is that um, I'm going to be your solutions journalism uh, guide dog, not the watchdog. So um, I wanted to cover three main points before we delve into talking about perhaps some of my articles that I wrote that have a solutions bent. So I just wanted to emphasize again that so SOJO, as we abbreviate it in the US because we have to abbreviate everything there, it's not advocacy journalism and it's not a gimmick or, and it's also not a cult. It was founded by a couple of New York Times reporters in the US that built this network and have tried to take it as widely as they can. Um, I know myself that I'm a very skeptical person, so I thought, ooh, what is this? But, um, so nobody can force you to do it, but if you try it, you, you might um, join the club, so to speak. Um, the advantages are that it allows for flexibility. There's no one way to do solutions journalism. There's no formula. It, it, um, it unravels depending on what topic you're covering. It can also be deployed for short news stories or features and long-form narratives, explanatory pieces, investigative pieces. You don't have to be an investigative reporter and have an editor who doesn't want you to spend more than you know, a day on something. You can still find a solutions angle once you delve into your topic. So how did I get here? Um, back in the 1980s, I started out at daily newspapers, if anybody remembers those. And um, 
I've been a U.S.-based reporter at um, various publications since then, uh, both print and then the evolution into digital. And I've always had a keen interest in nature and the outdoors, which led me to environmental reporting, which I'm pretty much self-taught on just by immersing myself in it, going to conferences and asking repeated questions of people who probably wished I would go away. Um, and so anyway, that led me to throw my heart and soul into deep features and investigative pieces at places like Inside Climate News, where we were one of the first to focus on these enormous problems with oil and gas pipelines that were a threat to the environment. Um, and I realized that being an energy reporter really mattered because if we didn't figure out our energy use, we wouldn't have an environment to worry about anymore. So energy seemed key. So in 2015 and 16, I started to hear feedback from more and more readers that they couldn't look at one more doomsday story about any aspect of the environment, whether it was climate change, water shortages, um, famine, anything related. They, they were shutting down, and I thought, oh, well, why are we putting all this work into things if people are too depressed to read it? Um, so I was seeking an approach that could give people a little more hope, and not false hope, but hope. And um, I, somewhere on social media, I heard about a, a solutions journalism training in Washington, D.C. I ran up and attended. And um, then within about six months, um, Trump was elected. So, and here I can use my, my limited French vocabulary and say, nous sommes des soleils. <laughs> Um, so, and I also, as a side note, downstairs at the um, Arts and Sciences, the Arts and Humanities and Sciences group, they are talking about democracy today, coincidentally. So you might want to go down and sit in one of those big orange couches and listen to, um, I probably need a refresher in democracy. I might go down there. But, so anyway, instead of jumping from a tall building or out a window, because I couldn't write articles about the new administration's deconstruction of energy and environmental policies, even though they need to be written and we need to get the word out, and we are. Um, I felt liberated to change, and I jumped into freelance writing. Um, I was also trying to work on a book, so the freelance worked into this well um, for, for my career selfishly. So what I wanted to find out is where were people collaborating to find climate solutions and how were they doing it? I wanted to look at places that had a long time reliance on fossil fuels and what kind of answers they were coming up with. So I guess my third point is as a freelancer, I am a bit of an outlier with solutions journalism. In the US, I know that they are intent on doing a lot of total newsroom training to sort of get the whole team involved in a newsroom. Um, so, and also, just if you are a freelancer and you have to do the, you know, the regular pitches to editors, I never use the, the word solu solutions journalism in my pitches because it kind of sounds like jargon. So instead, I just pitch a story and I do my angle, but I don't have to go into that layer because I think it complicates things. But on this journey, I have found it liberating and refreshing because I can still give readers thoughtful, rigorous, rigorously reported stories that have signs of hope. They include concrete examples of replicable work in real communities. And I also find it powerful because I can give, um, I can give a, I don't know, I can give background to people who are often ignored. I can give a voice to people who are being ignored in the U.S. or, for instance, uh, former coal workers in the U.S. and Appalachia, they're kind of become caricatures in our country. And by talking to them and writing stories about what's really going on, I find that uh, helping them have a voice that isn't just... Um, a ridiculous um, minimization of who they are and what they are helps. And um, none of these are sappy stories. They make people think, they make people learn about a problem, and they learn about solutions that they didn't even know um, existed. So it sort of, I'm hoping what it does is sort of 
end the paralysis. And my, my focus has been looking at places where land and people are being restored um, because we have you know, this whole long history of fossil fuels, which has contributed to climate change. That's sort of the focus I've taken with, with land and people. So I will head back, and I'm hoping we can uh, delve into some specific examples. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, some of your, the pieces you wrote will be included tomorrow in the newsletter of, of the conference that has been arranged with uh, the people here. Um, just wanted to start with a, a short question about terms. Uh, is there a difference, Nina, between uh, solution journalism and constructive journalism? Yes, I believe there is. Um, constructive journalism is uh, probably broader than solutions journalism. So we, if constructive journalism is, you know, an uh, Indian goddess, then uh, solutions journalism is one arm. Um, we believe that uh, solutions, well, constructive journalism wants to look at solutions, but not, not only. So they, their objective is uh, to be future oriented and to change the tone in, in the media, um, adding more positive psychology in, you know, interviewing techniques. So it's much broader, I think, their objective. Okay, and the two organizations work together, or are they competitors? No, we are not competitors, but we we agree on the need uh, for you know looking for solutions. But solutions journalism is probably a bit more conservative, um, and but we we are yes, we are working together. All right. <laughs> um, the the. Um, I said I will not be neutral, but uh, I think that what you both said uh, makes sense. Um, it seems very clear to me that uh, the solution journalism is part of the solutions for journalism. But still, uh, there is a lot of resistance. I myself witnessed uh, at Le Monde people uh, telling me uh, I want to... I will not do that because I don't. I won't let uh, Bill Gates dictate how to do my job, <laughs> uh, for example. Um, do, do, do you also meet resistance in the newsrooms where you, you, you go? And, and you, Elizabeth, uh, do you sometimes find uh, resistance as well on your, on your way? I meet less and less resistance. I meet less resistance than three years ago. Uh, I think uh, I was meeting resistance because the way solutions journalism um, uh, has been practiced at first, especially in Europe, was maybe too superficial, uh, too positive, and not uh, rigorous enough. But if you uh, manage to make people understand, journalists understand, that we are not here to suggest sol solutions, we are not here to do, uh, you know, positive news, but it's rather can be a, an investigative work, then they are ready to listen, and they agree that you know people are looking for solutions. So if you actually want to increase your audience, you better do solutions journalism. Uh, but the resistance, I think, was because the quality uh, of what journalists knew as solutions journalism, and it wasn't, uh, was not you know there. So I guess the example I would give is sometimes I'm making a pitch for a solution story that doesn't necessarily end up having a solution. <laughs> I, because sometimes I'm writing about the US Congress and they recently have not been involved in a lot of solutions. So for instance, in Appalachia, the coal miners were, a lot, there's a huge increase in black lung disease because the seams of coal are so much thinner, the silica, there's a lot of rock being mined instead of coal, so there's an enormous bump in black lung disease, which is horrible. So, I mean, nobody, everybody can agree on that, that it's a huge health issue. And the coal operators had been required to put money into a fund to help people because 
many coal miners, many coal operators are going bankrupt and the fund is shrinking and shrinking and you can't just leave people without health coverage. So what the coal miners were doing was was brilliant. They were helping to organize a campaign focused in Appalachia, but it, it focused on the whole country saying, please coal operators, please Congress pass this bill that increases the funding for the people with black lung and the health problems and also increases a large pot of money from the coal operators, there were no tax dollars involved that would help to restore communities where coal had been harvested and kind of hollowed out these, not kind of, it had hollowed out communities and, let, and people were leaving. So that money would have restored the land and the people and the, the other pot of money would have, res, would help you know, you can't, you can never recover from black lung, but at least you don't have to, you know, die a, a more painful death without health care. So I was writing this saying, look at these people who have come, tried to come up with this brilliant solution to a huge problem, and, you know, we're still waiting for that legislation to pass. So that was a, the story that I put out there as a solutions, and I guess it was, because I thought the thinking was so good on this, but, you know, that, that was, but like I said, the pitches, I don't say, I have a solution story. I just say, here's a story. This is what I'd like to tell, so. Thank you. Um, now, if, uh, about this resistance, um, I think there are several reasons. Um, maybe some journalists believe they are here just to observe uh, things and not to, to be proactive in, in, in that observation. Um, maybe another reason for resistance is that sponsors and philanthropists love journal uh, solution journalism and they, they are keen to, to, to finance it and to, to, to fund uh, projects with solutions. And that might provoke on the newsroom side kind of a reaction, oh, okay, uh, the, um, if, if Bill Gates or if uh, a big company is pushing for that solution, maybe there is something tricky. What do you answer to this? Well, <coughs> first of all, uh, newsrooms that are, you know, going into solution journalism are not necessarily the ones that are funded by Gates or whoever. I I gave trainings to. Uh, you might have heard of uh, investigative media that is uh, al only investigating locally in France. It's called Media Cité. It's kind of like Medi Mediapart, but for local uh, cities. And I went there and I thought I would meet some resistance and they, they don't receive any money from gays. <laughs> and uh, they were happy about it. They were like, yes, first of all, it, it is an information. So if, if you say they should not be proactive, what, it's not about being proactive. It's, it's about what, what is the reality looks like. The reality looks like, well, there are problems, but that's not it. There are also people trying to resolve that pro these problems. And they, the journalists in this newsroom were aware of that. And it also, they could feel that their audience started to get tired of you know, all these investigative pieces that you, know, you read in the morning, you just want to go back to bed because it's so depressing. So to increase their audience and to reach new people, they needed to keep their investigative work, but look for other topics. And as I was saying, it's just telling the story differently. Otherwise, you always tell the same story. I often give, you know, when you have shootings in the States, sorry, Elizabeth, for that example, <laughs> but you can just change the name of the city, change the name of the killer, change the number of the victims, and date, and you always tell the same story. So if you want to tell your readers a new story with a new, you know, concrete information that could help th them, you know, think about the topic differently, then you could also look for solutions. It's, it's one of the tools that you have to tell the story differently. No, but I understand the, the pushback from journalists because we love to consider ourselves independent and we don't want to be owned by anybody. So as a freelancer, I, you know, I am paid by the publication that, um, 
that I'm writing for. As well, I've gotten some grant money from the Solutions Journalism Network, which has a, a pot of money that they you apply for a grant to help you travel to the site, and that is immensely helpful. But so I, I understand the the pushback. I don't. You know, I don't take any funding from anybody that says, oh, you're a solutions journalism freelancer, here's a check, write this stuff. So I understand it, but I also think that the, the whole model of newsrooms is changing in the U.S. and we don't, you know, the daily papers, yes, they've, they've always, you know, kind of run the show, but now we've got a, an enormous number of nonprofit newsrooms that are all competing for dollars. I don't know what's going to happen there. So they could be compete, even if they're not doing solutions journalism, they're still competing for, for dollars. They could be getting Gates dollars to do you know, everyday journalism that we've been doing for 100 and 200, whatever, years. So I, I think that's a, that can be a double-edged sword. So I think that if you're doing solutions, it shouldn't look like you're, um, you're tainted by, um, you know, Gates money or whatever it's coming from, because this nonprofit model is so pervasive now, and everybody is, and, and plus there's all this guilt about you know, newsrooms dying, so money is being pumped into them now. We'll see what happens. It's an interesting time. Yeah, still, like, if you if you take the position of someone working for the advertising department of a newspaper, speaking with a brand, let's say Bayer or Monsanto, and if you speak with them about solution journalism, they would be much more open to to go ahead uh, in some dealing, deals with you than if you speak about investigative journalism, right? Um, hmm. And is that a problem for you, Nina? Um, is that a problem that solutions join themselves? Well, probably not, but I understand your point. But what, um, what we've seen also is, uh, you know, investigative reporters rely now rely on, for example, membership. They, they expect the audience to pay for the content because, you know, they will expose wrongdoing, bring some new information that you haven't heard about. It's also true for solution science. Uh, people are ready to pay for this because it's, they are ready to pay for quality. No matter, you know, the topic, they are ready to pay for quality and for information they don't hear about. They don't hear about solutions, so they are ready to pay for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, on the, the um, practical point of view, I mean, uh, solution journalism seems to be most of the time kind of an individual initiative of people like you who, who, who are convinced and who try something. Um, more and more we, we can see uh, some structures being, being put in place, like uh, The Guardian has recently launched a, a, a vertical called The Upside, with Mark Oxley being, being the, the, the editor of that part. Uh, what do you see, uh, Nina, in the newsrooms where you go? Uh, do you see individuals motivated by solution journalism, or do you see uh, editors uh, setting up structures for that? Uh, I think both happens, but uh, anyway, it's always like maybe one, you know, individual, one champion, maybe as you were like a, a kind of solution journalism uh, champion. I wasn't at that very time. successful. <laughs> I tried to set up a desk at Le Monde for solution journalism, and uh, uh, then I, uh, I got some money for that, and then I left Le Monde to create Heidi News. And one month after my departure, the, the project was cancelled, and uh, Le Monde had to give back the money. So that was a trauma. Yes. Well, but it's often, you know, carried by individuals that. Uh, believe in solution science. I mean, it can be a reporter, it can be a photojournalist, and they, well, if they manage to convince the editors, or they call us and ask for help to convince the editors, and that's where we, we come in and we talk with them, and we, yes, uh, you have, anyway, you have to have the editors on board, otherwise change don't happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is it possible to have a quick uh, overview of how many people want to ask questions so I can measure how long time we continue the discussion, the three of us? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so uh, one last question and then I, I, I go to the, um, to the audience. Um, 
For, for me, the main reason is passivity. I think uh, of the audience. I mean, when you when you get constantly bad news, you become passive, you become negative, and you feel helpless, as you said. Um, a solution is, is empowering people. I mean, is giving them ways to a reason to, to for hope and a reason for action. Uh, if something is possible, then you can you can be useful. And I think it's a very powerful trigger. Um, do you have examples of uh, actions in real world being uh, um, triggered by solution journalism? Uh, we've seen uh, examples of, uh, yes, uh, a coverage of a solution that put pressure on the decision decision uh, makers at, at a local level. Uh, there is this uh, a story in Cleveland that I really like. It's so they had a problem with lead uh, poisoning. So you know, lead in the paintings in the homes built in the 70s, uh, and it. Uh, it contaminates uh, childs and pregnant women, particularly, and they had this problem for decades. So each time, you know, you would have a problem with the kid, then you would have a coverage, and people would, you know, uh, get so mad about this problem, and 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 the story remained the same all the time. Um, and one day they decided to go <coughs> and see which city in the U.S. had met the same problem and succeeded in tackling that problem. And they found, that, that found out that the city of Rochester succeeded to tackle that problem. They made a great piece about it. And after the, the piece was, was published, I think a third of the team of the council was uh, fired and they took real action to follow the Rochester model. So yes, it can have an impact. It's hard to link it to solution journalism. It's, uh, I mean, it's a bit pretentious to say we've done that, but you you can see at least that the conversation is changing, is improving. You know, the quality of the conversation, even in the comments uh, from the audience. Uh, you you don't have any more negative comments, even if it's you know people disagree in the comments, but it's not just negative. It's not just you know people harassed. So yes, I see an impact. Um, just about uh, last question before the the, the room um, impact. I mean, uh, so we you said solution journalism, constructive journalism. W what about impact journalism? How do you define it between the two, or is it something else? I think impact journalism uh, is a term used to for solution journalism. Uh, I'm just not really comfortable with that but i mean it doesn't matter as long as you know you produce quality content i'm fine but impact journalism really has uh, a focus on you know having an impact giving inspiration and in solutions journalism i think if you give inf inspiration that's good it's a bonus but it's not the main objective the main objective is to give a complete picture and understanding on the topic. And that's why I'm not comfortable with the term impact. You can have an impact that could good, but it's not your main objective. All right, can I, can I just Go ahead. play off of that? Of I mean, I just wanted to, to cite an article that I worked on just to get that out there about, just to give an example of a small community near Buffalo, New York, uh, was had its major tax payer shut down, which was a coal-fired power plant. So this is where you get into these strange juxtapositions where, yes, the coal-fired power plant was being shut down after 100 years. Great. The air was going to be cleaner. All the benefits were there. The, the river was going to be cleaner. And this is, you know, near the Erie Canal. This is the muscular part of of uh, the United States where manufacturing was born and it opened up the West for good or for bad, all of that. So this little tiny town was going to lose its main taxpayer. And so what did they do? Well, the, the environmental people were cheering about this. They said, yay, we're, we're going to have cleaner air, cleaner water. 
But meanwhile, they were having to lay off teachers. They thought that their school district was going to be absorbed by the large city of Buffalo. There were many, there was a lot of blowback. So what happened? Um, and I read about this, some little blurb in a newsletter, a labor newsletter, and I thought, I think there's a story in here. I don't know what it is, but let me find out. I got a grant from the Solutions Journalism Network. I, interv I went on the ground. I interviewed dozens of people. A small environmental justice group, which was concerned about what's going to happen to our community, brilliantly organized a campaign where they educated people in their town about what this means. What does it mean when you lose tax dollars? What does it mean when you have to lay off teachers? What does it mean when you're looking out, laying off many of your city workers? They organized a campaign and they learned how to lobby their state legislators. And back at that time, the Senate in New York State was Republican, the House was Democrat, Democratic, but they did pass legislation that put, so the state said, we are going to put millions of dollars in a fund. It will be available as gap funding for any community in New York that is affected by the shutdown of a coal-fired power plant. Now, later that was expanded to include nuclear power plants and, and other power plants, but it started with coal-fired power plants. So it's an example of the moving away from fossil fuels, and people cheer that, but at the same time, there are repercussions. So this was a solution, and New York did it. Now, Wyoming is trying to do it. There are other states that are trying to follow this model. This is a story that kind of went viral with no effort on my own, because people were, they wanted to read, what do we do? We're all in this situation. Nobody's talking about it. And look what New York did with this little teeny weeny group that took it upon themselves and organized. So that's an example of an impact. And mm -hmm. they had a solution. And now, you know, it could be a 50 state solution. Thank you very much. So, questions. Who wants to ask a question? There are two uh, microphones on the <coughs> side. Alice, maybe <coughs> walk down to the microphones. It's going to be easier than circulating. Yes, sir. A uh, great session. Uh, Andy Revkin, uh, now at Columbia University. I was in journalism for a long time, and I still am. Um, the you didn't mention one model that I think is worth discussing, which is uh, journalists as conveners of communities as well. I don't know, Nina, if that's been something, or, or actually Nancy on, on your radar, when you have a perennial issue, climate impacts, setting aside solutions, what's the role of media or can be the role of media in actually being the convener of discussions and helping communities identify solutions? And one other quick thing, it's really interesting to note in the science community, there's a very parallel evolution happening. Um, 1997, Dan Kamen, a Berkeley scientist, and Michael Dove wrote a paper called The Virtues of Mundane Science. Mundane Science. <laughs> what they meant was useful. <laughs> in other words, frontier science is mostly what we think about here, uh, meetings like this. But what about science that's useful right now to communities around the world struggling with problems? So there's a lot of synchronicity in science right now? Uh, yes, to in inspire your question, I think uh, it's almost natural when doing solutions journalism to uh, include your readers in the process of, you know, when you do your story. The first reason to that is as the co-founder of uh, the Solutions Journalism Network often say, uh, David Bornstein is, uh, you know, problem scream and solutions whisper. So <laughs> if you actually want to hear about the solutions, you need to rely on, you know, you, your community uh, to help you identify where are these solutions. Um, and it's also, we've seen, uh, we have a great example, the Seattle Times uh, did a, it was supposed to do be a year-long story on uh, education issues in the, in the Washington states, and it's 
they are not in now in their sixth year because it's doing so well. Uh, when they started to to launch this project around, you know, what are the solutions to our education problems? The first thing they did is to rely on the community. So they organized a one-day workshop between uh, educators, parents, and people involved, and then they had a two hours open debate with the people in Seattle, and they had a Facebook page where people could interact, and yes, I think it's really important to include them. Thanks. Maybe we should switch the side, sir? Yes, ma'am. Uh, first, thanks, uh, thanks for you all, because uh, I think that you are bringing in the good old values of journalism back to the uh, business. Uh, I'm Jarmo Salman from Finland, and some 10 years ago I was bringing a concept of innovation journalism from Stanford to Finland. And the basic idea was at that time when the newsrooms started to shrink that the science beat is almost closing down. And one way to survive is to combine the science reporting and business reporting in some way that makes, me, makes the science writing uh, more meaningful and more useful. And it seems that uh, the solution is on the same continuum, that we have to invent something that makes the science reporting meaningful for the new newspapers and the media at large again. Uh, the experience was that the uh, newsrooms are mo one of the most conservative environments in the world. And uh, making people learning new habits is extremely painful. <laughs> you, <laughs> painful. And uh, when you have been teaching, what are your two tips that uh, make people try out second time for ri writing about solutions? and some uh, meaningful results of the basic research. Thank you very much, <coughs> Nina or Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I thank you. Wow. wow. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm trying to figure out wh what, how do we motivate people to do that? Yeah, I think what you have to do is have things like the Solutions Journalism Network and the convening that Andy brought up is really important. And the, you know, the network has an annual conference every year in the U.S. in Utah. And these, as we gel, as people come up with more ideas, these things are only going to become more concrete. Now it's been people individually acting, but it is going to do nothing but become more newsroom centric and it, it will become more baked into what news is, I, I think. Thank you. Madam? Hi, uh, Marine Cornu. I work for Quebec Science Magazine. I have a more practical question. I was wondering, you know how it's not recommended to base a, um, a story on a single study or, and sometimes I find that it's also hard to report on research projects that are starting and don't have any results yet. And how do you balance, like sometimes solutions are really anecdotal or it, as you said, it's in a small community that tried something and you don't know if it works, you don't know if it's evidence-based. So how, how, how do you, how do you tackle this? Yeah, now that's an excellent question and I think that you need to, you, you can't over-promote something. So you need to state that exactly in the story and say, here's a nascent result. Let's look at this. You don't have to write an investigative piece on it. You can present it and even just do a, a shorter feature. And then you can accumulate those and use them later. So don't oversell what you have, but make sure people understand. This is, this is new, but let's look at this. Maybe it will become a trend. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Hello. Um, I'm Martin Clavier. Uh, I'm a French freelance. Um, I like the, the idea of um, g giving solutions to readers. But for example, I'm working on science publishing. And when I'm writing on SIAD, uh, I'm writing about a solution uh, for access to researchers. 
but I'm working. I'm uh, writing also about a business problem for Elsevier Springer Nature ACS and their employees. So, is the concept uh, of the solutions depend of the point of view of the widow or a point, the point of view of the journalist? Who defines what is a solution? <clears throat> well, I think it's a conversation. I'll just start that out. I think you, if, if you're a, a freelancer and you're working with an editor, you're going to have to have th those individual conversations with editors as the stories come up. I don't think there's one, there's one answer to that. If you, if you start thinking there's only one answer, that's where you get into trouble. So discussing it and saying, well, this is what I think. What do you think? How do we, what is going to make us look, you know, unbiased? Because otherwise, that, that's the part, that's why you always need a second, third, fourth opinion on these things, because you can, you can go into a, a rabbit hole that you might not want to climb out of. So, and you'll use the same judgment as you know for a usual story. What is a good story for you, anyway? So. <laughs> okay, sir, please. Yeah, so I have a, a kind of a, a similar question, but uh, more in the context about uh, advocacy. Mm -hmm. So, since both of you mentioned how a solution journalism should not be advocacy, and I'm having some problem trying to understand that so for instance uh since it's impossible to identify all the problems in the world once you identify it's also diff uh, once you identif uh, you've identified a problem uh, then i also think it's impossible to write about all the solutions about that specific problem so just the fact that as a journalist we're the, per we're the people who end up writing the article and selecting a specific solution or a number of solutions but it's never the complete picture uh, don't we, by default, endorsing certain solutions? And I kind of mm. view that as a form of advocacy. An example that I want to give was like, since the 80s, since Chernobyl happened, uh, people, there's a lot of uh, 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 reporting about kind of uh, uh, stirring fear about nuclear power. And then now with climate change, you hear a lot about solutions using wind power or solar power, but you don't really hear a lot about nuclear power anymore. So just the fact that journalists are writing solutions to solve this climate change problem, uh, about, let's say, you using wind power, solar power. Don't we, by default, kind of become an advocate for those powers just by writing about it? I don't. I don't think you become an advocate by writing about it. I think you're you're keeping up with the trends of what's going on, and you know, solar and wind have, are having their moment right now. So news <sighs> reporters are paying attention to this. That doesn't mean you're advocating for it. I I think, uh, like any reporter. Yes, you you need to delve into the, the to the nuclear discussion, which is playing out in the United States now. Well, you know, nuclear plants plants were going to be shut down, and now, oh, maybe not. Maybe we need to keep those open. I mean, there are many conversations going on, but I don't think because you choose to write a news story, you're advocating for one specific example. I think it's a, I think you use. In, in any news story, you're using your best judgment and you're talking with editors and you're making sure. I, I just, I don't think because you write about something, it means you're advocating for it. I think you've, you're presenting it and you can mention it's not perfect, but here's, here's, one, here's an answer at the moment. It, it doesn't even need to be an answer. It's just, it's the news. So I, I don't think, you know, because I'm writing about something, I'm an advocate for it. It's interesting, and I've delved into it and talked to dozens of people. So I, I would beg to differ. Sir? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Mauro Bonocore. I'm communication officer for CMCC, which is a research center on climate change, based in Italy. And we are supposed to be a source of information, scientific knowledge, and data. Um, I mean, uh, uh, which is the role of science in this specific um, uh, process of building stories uh, in uh, solution journalism? Which is the role of science uh, in the way that Nina describes uh, solutions journalism? And uh, in the way that Elizabeth uh, uh, makes solutions stories? Thank you. Well, I think science can help uh, first 
uh, reporters understand, you know, what are we talking about exactly, and also identify solutions. So you're probably uh, in the first step of the reporting, which is, you know, where I'm going to look at. I, ha I think I have to shorten, so I'll yeah. you. A very short question. Uh, I have the impression that uh, solution journalism speaks about uh, small-scale solution in a town or things like that. And can it um, give the false impression that all can be solved with small solution? And sometimes, for example, uh, climate change, we need also uh, big towns, uh, well, big, big uh, cities, sorry, big uh, countries solution and I even international solutions. Yeah, I mean, we'd be irresponsible if we were misleading people. And I think that always needs to be qualified, that here is an example of something. It is not the panacea. So that's, that's a good point, because we can jump from tiny solution to tiny solution and end up with nothing. But Right, right. So thank you for raising that. So we have run out of time. Um, maybe, okay, one last question and then okay. we have to, to leave the stage. Thank you. Uh, Anna is now Swiss journalist independent. <coughs> My question is, uh, do you think that um, investig uh, the uh, um, <coughs> solution journalism and the investigation journalism is... Um, uh, complementary because uh, if we have a solution uh, how clean the water and uh, but we don't know that uh, uh, the politics don't um, put the enough money for that so we need an investigative journalist who who give this information which is uh, 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 very uh, negative information, and after we need a solution journalist who can complete this, what we can do. So for me, it's um, for me personally, it's a complementary. So we mm -hmm. need both. Yes, um, I, I, I will answer this question because I. I <laughs> That's exactly what I did. At Le Monde, I always published a serial of articles, some of the, about the problems, some about the solutions, and you cannot separate everything. So um, I believe the solutions are stronger when you have well exposed the problem and even investigated about the problem. So it's all linked. I mean, it's 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 not. Uh, if you only do solutions, then you 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 lose the. the the, 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 the relation to, to, to reality, to investigation, to who, right. who responsibility of, of different entities, etc. Yeah, yeah, because, excuse me, because uh, I think that if um, the uh, solution journalism becomes a big trend um, and we, uh, we forget the investigative journalism, so it can be um, quite um, disappointed for public. I think so. It's not yet a big trend, I think. It's still a few percent of, of the production, right? right? Well, anyway, it's not, uh, you know, aimed to replace other forms of journalism. It's just one more tool, but it's not... Aimed it will always be complementary. Yes. yes. Thank you very much, thank everybody. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank Merci. you.